Well, first of all, thank you guys for coming to, to my little session here. I know you could be in a million other places by the pool or in somebody else's cooler uh, workshop, but uh, presentation, but I, I appreciate it. What we're going to talk about today is constructability and harnessing SketchUp to, to predict mistakes and delays and issues before you build. So first of all, what is constructability? What does it mean? Constructability is a project management technique to review construction processes from start to finish during pre-construction phase, is to identify obstacles before a project is actually built to reduce or prevent errors, delays, and cost overruns. My name is John Brock. I've been a custom home builder and designer for about the last 30 years, and um, been obsessed with, like many of you, with SketchUp with 3D modeling. I've pushed the limits of it over the years, and um, and for the last five or six years, SketchUp's been my, my one and only tool uh, that I use. I've got a book coming out, SketchUp for Builders. This is a, hopefully coming out by sometime in the next few months. I was wishing it could be by now, but that's with Wiley Publishing, so it didn't happen. But just be on the lookout for that. Um, for the last five years or so, five or six years ago, I guess about five years ago, my buddy Dwayne Addians is in the crowd right here. We were working on a project. He, he uh, got the attention of SketchUp with a file that it was like, a, what was it, a technical issue with a layout file or something like that. Yep. Anyways, they, they, they kind of went, wow, man, this is some cool stuff. And they reached out to him. He was telling them about what we do and how we've been kind of pushing the limits of SketchUp. And next thing you know, we're talking at AIA for them and been doing that for the last five years at AIA and IBS and got to know all the guys and um, <laughs> including Tom, Tom in the back, Mr. This guy has written so many, probably what, 50 plugins or more that you've probably all used. Um, but I wanted an estimating solution because I was a builder and I could model these things and I could, you know, model this beautiful house and this roof. Well, how many squares of shingles are on it? You know, how many sheets of sheeting? And I couldn't find a solution. You know, so I was cobbled together, uh, you know, cut list and profile builder one back then and some other tools, but ultimately had to put it all in Excel and to try to create my estimates. So. About three years ago, I finally bit the bullet after asking these guys if, if they were going to have an estimating solution. And uh, so I created Estimator for SketchUp. And so I've got a booth here today if anybody has any interest in any of that. Um, started out with Estimator. And uh, from there, I needed other solutions that I didn't have. So we created a Framer for SketchUp, which is a parametric wall framing plugin. Um, and you'll see some of that during this. And Issue Tracker, since I'm wanting to note issues or problems or mistakes or whatever, um, I can drag that little red icon that you see over on an issue, put information about it, and then it creates a PDF for you with a picture of the image and description of the problem. So it's kind of a quick little markup tool for SketchUp. And then recently, PDF Importer, which, how many of you try to import PDFs or drawings into to a drawing? Yeah. So I needed a way of getting them in there. You can import a CAD file, but uh, more often than not, we're all getting PDFs, and uh, so I needed a way of getting the, the drawings in vector-based instead of a raster image that you have to trace over top of. So you'll see some of that too as well. Uh, for today, for the agenda, uh, we're going to talk about how, how I use SketchUp to study constructability, both for my own custom home building business and then working for other uh, builders across the country. Um, the workflow, you know, how I model each phase of construction, because I literally go from the full site, pre-site to final site and everything in between. Uh, constructability reviews, that's just a term I use for when I'm doing a review of a structure and, and identifying issues, especially now working for other builders. Um, that's just what I call the report that I send to them. And I'm going to show you guys some case studies, and we'll go into some SketchUp models, so that's not just a bunch of slides, uh, to show you some of the results of uh, of these studies. So first of all, how many builders do we have in the room? Not a lot, okay. How many architects? Cool. All right, engineers? Awesome. What about landscape architects? Landscape people? Interior people, interior designers? What else? What am I missing? What do you do? AV. AV? Yeah, cool. Okay. You use SketchUp for that or for laying out stuff or what? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, in, in the construction process, you know, we have a whole bunch of collaborators. There's the builder, starts out with an architect or a draftsman, 
You've got the builder, you've got the structural engineers are involved because they're taking the architect's plans and they're, they're specifying the structural elements. They're sending their own drawings. You know, sometimes the architects will combine them with the full set of drawings. Other times it's a separate set of drawings. And uh, we got trusses, TJIs, you got separate vendors for those. And you'll have engineers, civil engineers and landscape architects that are doing site plans. And of course, then you have the trades. And as builders, we have to kind of pull all that together to pull off a project. And I know for a fact there's clashing issues and, and so forth that happens when you're cobbling all these plans together. So sort of how the story begins, if you went to Big Daddy's CAD session yesterday or Big CAD session yesterday, I stole this slide from him. This is one of his slides. But this is actually a house that uh, the guy sitting ne next to him, Larry Belk, designed out in Texas. And he hired us to do, I built the full model down to the stud, down to every outlet and switch and everything in the house. And then Dwayne took that. And well, first of all, everything was estimated as well. So we were able to provide them takeoffs for everything. And <clears throat> then Dwayne did all the working drawings and all these beautiful renderings that you see. So that whole house was tricked out from start to finish, all inside of SketchUp, except for the rendering. And some of this information we got out of that is, for example, the drywall that in there, Larry was telling me that, you know, I gave them all the specification, or how many sheets of drywall would go in that house, 48s, 54s, the whole nine yards, because it was completely modeled. And he said something to the effect that the builder, the quote that the builder got from the drywall guy was 40% higher than the numbers that I had. And uh, so when they sort of asked him about that and wanted to produce the number of boards and the order of the actual boards that we had, it was, it was pretty spot on. Is that true to say. So that builder started seeing that he could save a lot of money by getting people to sharpen their pencils and all this. But as a result of that, for the last 10 years, I've been a member of a Builder 20 Club through the Home Builder Association. It's a, I don't know if any of you builders in the room are part of that, but it's a great thing to do for your business. It's, you're paired up with other builders across the country, sort of like-size companies, like-size operations, and you share all your ideas and information and books and everything, and it's just a great way to learn. And for years, I've been doing this kind of stuff, and Dwayne and I have been pushing each other to get better and better at this. And the guys in my club would always be like, you know, your renderings, your animations, John, it's cute and all, it's good, but are you making any money at it? I'm like, well, my clients like it. I get to show them everything, you know, ahead of time. So one day I was showing them an example of a house that I got, uh, how SketchUp got me a million dollar job. So this was a house that was, uh, I built on a, a lake in a little community outside in Southwest Virginia, a little resort area. And uh, this guy was getting ready to build this house and he had another builder lined up and uh, he heard about the 3D stuff that I was doing and was interested. So he's a car buff too, I came to find out. But when I saw the plans, which were pretty crappy to begin with, um, if you look on the side, slide to the right or over there, you'll see a scissors truss or dashed outline for like a scissors truss in the garage. And I'm going, why does he need a cathedral ceiling in his garage? You know? So I asked him about it. He said, yeah, I need, I'm going to put some car lifts in there. I've got my sports cars. I'm going to store one of them. And then, then in one of the bays, I'm going to be able to jack the car up and work on it. And I'm just, I'm just looking at that drawing going, that's not going to work, man. So I, um, I just modeled the garage with those scissors trusses and then modeled a car lift. I don't know if I, and some cars I got off of SketchUp off the warehouse. And I'm not sure about the car lift. I probably just mimicked it from looking on, you know, Googling car lifts and that sort of thing, but stuck it in there and showed the car up in the roof. There was just no way it was gonna work. And he was like, holy crap, I was getting ready to, you know, start this house. So I modeled it. Also, I moved that silly dormer that he had between those two doors and moved it to the center and stick frame the roof and moved the, the collar ties or the ceiling joists up and gave him the room that he needed you know, to do this for his cars. And I said, not only that, is stick framing, it was actually $1,500 than those, cheap, than those uh, cheaper than those trusses were. So needless to say, I got the job just from that. I just modeled what you see right there, just enough to kind of get him, uh, get him the idea. So that was when they were like, you know, okay, well maybe you got something going there. So my guy in Jacksonville was like, man, they're always screwing up my trusses, you know, I wish you could do that for me. I said, I can, let's get your guy on the phone. So uh, how many of you import trusses into your plans? Cool, all right. So, and, and we'll talk about that. If anybody wants to know how to do that, that, that is hearing this, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll talk about that. But, so what I did is I got me this truss file and this was a house down in Jacksonville. He was getting ready to start. He was getting ready to actually order these trusses when he got back home. 
And just by looking at them, I could see that the HVAC chases weren't lining up. That's a pretty common issue. And then when I snapped the trusses right on top of the top plate where they go, on the back, they were an inch too short, which is another telltale thing, sign that they'd use sheathing to sheathing dimensions instead of framing to framing. Sometimes it's vice versa. Sometimes they're half inch too long each end. But the point is, they were, they were too short. And they bared on the center wall that was there, and they had staggered the trusses. And his goal was to put the air handler in the back half of that garage, get up in the truss cavity or bay, and cut across and then get in the chase. So he was blocked at both points. And also with those trusses being short on that two before wall, yeah, the guys in the field would have shoved one truss one way, one the other way, but they would have ba barely been bearing on that wall. So we were able to go back and get them to completely revise that. Um, we sent them a video of a YouTube clip I had done of that. And his HVAC guy goes, man, we've been putting a, a pain in the ass factor on your job for years because the ductwork never works. He said, if you do this kind of detail review, we'll cut that out, you know? And um, so I probably saved him five grand in a half an hour or an hour, you know? So he's like, now that I will pay for. So that's when I finally started thinking, well, you know, these guys don't care what the finish is, but is it gonna save them some money? So he went back the next morning at our meeting and he told, told everybody else, you know, what we had done. I had probably had 10 plans in my inbox by lunchtime that day. And uh, one of them was my guy in Dallas. <clears throat> so Victor Myers, he was getting ready to build this big uh, 9,000 square foot house. And it was on uh, pilings and grade beams. And he's not used to that. He's used to doing houses on slabs. And this was gonna be on a crawl space because the soils in this area on this lake community moved dramatically. And so we had to go to that different alternative foundation. So he was asking if I could start with the foundation, which I do anyways first. But the first thing I saw on the site plan was, and it may not be easy to see, but the, they gave you the finished floor reference of 558.5. And then the grade just outside was 558. And that's only six inches. And I knew he had a, like a, a 14 inches worth of a floor system going on there. So just by looking at it, I could tell it'd be an issue. So what I did is I modeled the topography like you see all the grades in there, and I'll show you how that works in a, in a few. And this was the detail that was in the plans. You see this stem wall that's in there with a, with a TJI floor system sitting on top of a sill plate. So they would have been backfilling eight inches of dirt against that band. And they were getting ready to start in two weeks. So we went back to the engineers, and I asked if they could do a inverted brick ledge. It raised the, the little stem wall up and do an inverted brick ledge like you can see on the front half of that house. By the time you got around back, the grade was okay and you didn't need it. But they were cool, they changed all that stuff uh, before the concrete guys showed up. So that alone would have been a really big mess financially for him uh, and a delay. So that's what it kind of looked like. It's, those pilings are sort of arbitrary, but I just did these little cylinders in SketchUp and modeled all the stem walls and all the footings. And then he had three masonry fireplaces and a safe room, I mean, it's Texas, so that one big pad in the middle is a safe room. But the others were masonry fireplaces. So the next thing I did is I got this beautiful colored drawing, 2D drawing of his TJIs and, and rim joists and LVL beams everywhere. Everything is labeled, dimensioned. It was really nice as far as a 2D drawing. Um, and there was drop sections, you know, with had a wine room that had a real heavy stone floor, all this stuff, tripled up TJIs. It was a huge order. And I couldn't get past that little line at the bottom, you know. Layout to be reviewed and approved by builder before ordering. And he was getting ready to order this whole package. It's probably a $60,000 package. So I went to modeling using, I had the structural engineer's uh, model and the architect's model, sort of combined that for the foundation. And then I modeled all the TJIs using his drawings and all the beams. And he had beams and TJIs running through every one of those masonry fireplaces. And you have to have hard slabs in there. So we were able to go back and get them to completely revise that before he ever even ordered it. So he didn't have that, you know, there had been a tremendous amount of waste and, and issues and head scratching. So that was cool, we stopped that. Then I got to the roof and he had 14 inch TJIs on the second floor of this house and a bunch of LVLs that were 16, 18, 20, 24 inches tall. And then two by six rafters, you know, that were what, a four and a quarter heel height on a 12, 12 pitch. So you got beams and TJIs sticking out everywhere. So where I come from, if you clip a beam like that, it's gonna be, they're gonna consider it the size of that lowest section. So they had to go back and re-engineer. That wall that you're looking at was in the master bedroom and they had to go to a two by six wall and clip that beam to hit that slope. 
that every one of those TJIs, and I know you can do this from experience, because I'm a carpenter myself and I've had to do this before, but you can put gusset plates on either side and cut that bevel to the TJI, but that's a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of man hours. But we were able to get that resolved too. So that's where it sort of constructability 3D started. I, for the first time in 30 years, I don't have a house under construction. I got two boys that I got through college and now they're both army lieutenants and on their own. And it's time for me to do something that I want to do and uh, get out of the mud and the subs and the picky clients and all that stuff for a little bit. So that's, <laughs> yeah, oh God, hey, 30 years, man, I've, I've done my tour of duty. Um, so anyways, that's where it started. So I've, I'm, I'm working for other builders now and some architects too, but it's been primarily for the sort of the high end custom guys that want this uh, sort of thing. And um, so what I'll do is I'll jump into uh, SketchUp. So we're looking at some SketchUp stuff and not just some slides. So what I'll talk about is the, the workflow uh, or the process. Um, the first thing I do is bring in the drawings. We all get drawings as most of us get drawings as PDFs. So as I was explaining before, there's ways of getting a PDF into SketchUp. Um, there's Inkscape, which is a free program you can download. And you can, you can just simply open it up, export it as a DWG, and then import that DWG into SketchUp. But most of the times you won't see any text. It's just going to be vectors. Um, so you won't be able to read anything, but hopefully you'll get the vector line work to come in. And when you're in Inkscape, Inkscape, it'll ask you to pick a page. You pick the page out of your PDF if there's multiple pages. You bring it in and you scale it, and uh, then you can start modeling. Um, Adobe Illustrator, if you already have that, that works. I spent $240 a year on Adobe Illustrator for the last five years just to do that. Just to open it up, export as a DWG, closed it. So I've been bugging one of my programmers forever uh, about coming up with a way to go directly uh, into SketchUp. So we came up with PDF Importer finally that allows you to go directly into SketchUp. You just pick that same page like you would do in Inkscape, but it brings it in. It's only vectors, so if there's rasters, bitmaps, colors, things like that, it won't come in. Uh, but I wouldn't want that anyways. I just want the vector lines that I can, that I can work with and snap to. So I bring in the floor plans. Uh, I bring them in one at a time. When you bring in these as a group, they come in as a group, and then you scale it. Like in this case, it's that I use that 24-foot garage dimension and uh, set the scale. You just double-click on the group and pick two points, type in the dimension in the measurement box in the lower right corner, and hit enter, and it will rescale uh, everything for you the proper scale. So then I'll put it on a layer that represents, um, for instance, this being the main floor. Um, my, my naming convention is AO1 floor plan, so that's what I would put that on. So then I do the same process, and I'll kind of move it. You see it's set sort of at the center of the axis of origin there. I want to move it into position where it's, you're sort of in the center of the model. So I move it to there, and then I do the same thing with the other floor plans. It'll look like a spaghetti mess here. But, so I've got the, the lower level. I put the main floor right at the origin. I stack all the floor plans to make sure that everything's aligning all the way around the whole house. And then I'll, um, I came in here, I'll, I'll drop them by, drop the lower plan down, the upper plan up if there is one. But you can see I referenced the section drawing. That's the first thing I do is make sure that there's a section drawing for the plans that, that will tell me the plate heights. And so I'm just using these guides right from SketchUp, you know, T for tape measure, just pick a point. I came down four inches because it's a, uh, the footing is four inches below that for the slab. Came up nine feet because it was a nine foot foundation. There's an inch and a half sill plate. There's an 18 inch floor truss and a three quarter inch subfloor. So that's where that floor plan lies. And then there's a uh, nine foot one and eighth wall with 11 and a quarter for two by 12s for the floor system above that and then three quarters of an inch of subfloor there. So now everything is sort of spaced out properly and uh, ready for me to model. But the, the first thing I do, uh, if I'm doing a site, is I'll bring in the site plan, uh, same kind of way. Hopefully, if you, if you uh, anybody ever get site plans from the surveyors, has contours in them and everything? So if they've already got the contours in them, it's awesome because they're already up where they need to be. They're in the Z axis. And typically, they're above sea level. So if you're up in Denver and they're 5,000 feet up in the air when you're at the model and they're way up there. Um, so if you got that, that's great. I, I bring the site plan in and I'll position it with the house. So I'll rotate the site to fit the house. I don't do the house to fit the site because you want the house to stay in your red and green axes. Um, I'll also, if anybody ever cares to see sun studies, because I do that a lot of times for clients, 
if you have your North Arrow in there, there's a, pro, a plugin called Solar North, and um, it's free. Didn't it, Tom Tom? Didn't it used to be part of SketchUp? Yeah. But now it's is it still a SketchUp tool? But you have to download it from the warehouse. Changing the North direction was removed because. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And anything that I say wrong, please tell me. Because <laughs> I'm self taught like probably everybody in this room. <laughs> so with Solar North, you can pick, uh, I'll show you what that looks like real quick. So, Solar North, this is what it looks like. This is toggling on the North. So you can see North defaults to the, the green axis there. Or you can set it. And I'm just going to kind of pick roughly the midpoint of this and then point it to where it is. And then now when you toggle it, it's pointing in the north. So I just use that for, I often get into doing sun studies for clients when I'm doing the full finished model and they can see where the sun's coming in in the morning or their bed or whatever, you know, in the great rooms and things like that. So once I've got it aligned with the house, I then put it in the proper elevation. Okay. And hopefully you're being given on your plans, like these are what the contours look like on this particular lot. They're about 300 feet above the ground because this particular lot, uh, subdivision was about 300 feet above sea level. And so I got the contours and I've got the 2D site down at the bottom. And what I like to do is actually draw these faces or model these faces for driveways, mulch beds, walkways, things like that. And I'll show you later what I do with those. If you know about drape and in, in your uh, sandbox tools, I'll actually drape those down onto the site and it cuts it in. You can retexture those things in it. It's pretty cool. So, um, so now that I've got everything set, I knew what the slab elevation was because I had in the plans where the finished floor needed to be. As long as you have one of them, I don't care if it's finished subfloor on the floor. Most of the times you're going to get both. If it's on a basement, you'll get the basement slab elevation. So I've got those in there. But the first thing I do is I actually model the, uh, I model the existing site. So what you're seeing there is uh, the existing contours. Now you can use from contours in the sandbox tools and that'll do, a, certainly I do a nice quick mesh. It's a triangular mesh, but there's a plugin by Fredo called uh, Topo Shaper. So how many use Fredo's, Fredo, Fredo, how do you mean to use his plugins? Cool. I got to meet him last fall at the dev camp. <laughs> he was a very elusive guy. Nobody knows what he does or whatever. He's just, I think he's from another planet myself because I mean, some of this stuff is like, well, Tom Tom's the same way. It's like magic. I don't know how you guys think and how you do this stuff. So what Topo Shaper will do, amongst a million other things, I don't even use half of the functions that he has in there. I'm not going to go through the process of how it's done, but uh, basically you select those contours and then you, you uh, run the script for um, Topo Shaper. And what it does is it's identifying all those contours and creates that mesh that you see, but it also puts a skirt around it like you're seeing on the bottom of this. Now, when you look at that when it's first done, it looks, oh, that's cool. It's a big chunk of ground, but it's not a solid. And in SketchUp, it will not report a volume unless it's a solid, okay? So the first thing I do is I double click on that, and what you notice is that the green surface that you see there, that came in from his plugin, green in the orange skirt is that surface will be a mesh, but the skirt's a, uh, is a group, and then there is no underside to it. So, um, and I've never, I should just reach out to him, ask him if there's any way of doing what I want it to do, but it takes two seconds where I reach, I, I click on the skirt and explode it. And then I'll go to the underside, which if I went to the underside, you see I've got a flat surface. When you first do it, there is no underside, so you can just pick two points to heal it um, to make it uh, a solid. And then when you click on it, you can observe a, uh, over an entity info, you'll see the, the, the volume is reporting. And if it's not reporting a, a, a volume, it's not a solid. And when you get doing these complicated sites, you will go nuts trying to figure out, because if there's one little teeny hair out of place, one little edge, it could be literally a needle in a haystack, or it is a solid. So I owe this guy in the back, Tom, a, pile of beers because he created Solid Inspector, all right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Solid Inspector is an amazing plugin. So I have, I have version one and two, and I've kept version one on there until I found out when I was teaching a class the other day that I didn't know what I was talking about. I kept version one on there because version two 
will actually fix it for you. And if it can't fix it, it says some things have to be done manually. And I click OK, and I'm OK, well, what, what is it? So I would go back to version one, and version one will put a bullseye on whatever it is that's lacking. So Dizon, one of the guys from SketchUp, was our proctor in the room the other day, and he goes, well, you know you can just hit tab, and it'll go to each one of those things. I said, no. You know, <laughs> I do now. So, so now you can just hit tab, and it'll take you and show you like a bullseye. It's just, Tom, you're from another planet. I don't get it. That's, that's fine. All right, so that's what the existing, and the reason I do the existing site next is because it has an impact on my foundation. So I'll bring the foundation plan in, and so now I know if I'm going to have sub-foundations. And I get building on some really steep lots at the lake that I built on, and it's, I'll get into four, five, six, eight, ten foot deep sub-foundations. And so for years, you know, you didn't have, you're just guessing at this, man, when you're looking at your plans and you're guessing at these concrete quantities and so forth. Now I'm modeling it down to the, you know, down to original ground and my concrete, you know, budgets have been dead on. And the other thing too is when you're actually doing these level of detail, you know, like a slab that's 1,893 square feet and your guy gives you a bill for 2,000 square feet and you know, no, it's 1,893. You know, you can show this thing and get them to sharpen their pencils. It's not being a jerk, it's just, you know, this is more accurate, you know. So I'll go through and I'll model the foundation based on this. So I'll show you more of a, uh, another example that took that a little bit further. This was a house in, uh, for a builder in Utah. One of the guys at Semi Club's got me doing every one of his houses now, and for, for some reasons I'll be showing you. So this was a, a back to front sloping lot. The street's actually down in here. So what I did is I created his existing topography, and there's the road down here, so give him some reference. So the next thing I did is I went in and I modeled the foundation, and a lot of this was done using Profile Builder. Anybody use Profile Builder? Yeah, Dale's here, he's got a booth set up. Uh, Profile Builder is an amazing uh, tool, another one from another planet. And it also works with Estimator, so anything I model with, like the foundation walls, as I model them in Estimator, I got my cubic yards, I got my lineal footage for labor, and that sort of thing. So you can you get a lot of information out of it. So I modeled the, the foundation, and I got his footings down to frost depth and all that good sort of stuff. And then when you compare it with the existing site, so you can see I got quite a bit of excavation to do uh, in there. So then I was given the proposed site as well, showing all the proposed contours, how the driveway's gonna go, and that sort of thing, uh, retaining wall along the driveway. And so from there, I went ahead and modeled the proposed site. Now that tells me two things, and that's, that's where Solid Inspector uh, definitely comes in handy. You can see how it's reporting a volume. I'm gonna pop in there just to, just to give Tom, Tom a little shout out. I'm gonna come into this thing I'm going to put one little teeny little edge. It's like that needle in the haystack. So now I'm not reporting a volume. I go to Solid Inspector, Tools, Solid Inspector 2, and it's going to find that stray edge, but I don't want to give it away yet. I'm going to go to his first one, Solid Inspector. See how that's got that bullseye on it? And you can't go anywhere until you just come right on in, and there it is. So that was the first one. So then I'd go, oh, okay, I, I, I can go in and fix that. Well, then he came out with Solid Inspector 2. And whoops, what happened there, Tom? Shouldn't have done that. So Solid Inspector 2. And it's got one stray edge. I say, fix it. And everything's shiny. Where'd you come up with that, buddy? I, like that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So yeah, so that's how this guy has saved me, I don't know how many man hours. I, I probably could not do it. Because when you start doing complicated slices like this, and you're, you're deconstructing the topography, what, what I do is I go in, I'll, um, I'll start literally going to my limits of, of construction, like we always all do. And I'll just delete all the geometry around uh, the perimeter of the house. And then draw a line around the backfill of the house and literally rebuild the grade. Most of the times I use from contours, but there's also soap skin bubble. Anybody use that? So that's a pretty cool plugin. But when you're doing stuff around all these retaining walls and you're, you're kind of building sections as you go, it is so easy to, to get a mistake in there somewhere. And that's where the solid inspector comes in. And there's also some other uh, selection toys. Anybody have that? Do you have that, Tom? Oh, I'm sorry, you invented it. <laughs> 
So solid, solid. I mean, uh, selection toys has a ton of features about it. But I would say uh, when you deconstruct these sites, you know, when you come in, let me show you real quick. When you have this existing site, and I'm going to just double click on this to edit it. See, there's that big mesh. If you say view hidden geometry, and shift H is my little way of hide rest of model. If you don't use a shortcut for hide rest of model, you might want to look into that. So hide rest of model will kind of toggle the other things that are in your way or out of your way when you're editing a group or a component. So I did mine on shift H just because it's easy for me to remember, but use it because it's a great. So you can see here, I'm going I'm to just kind of roughly select the surface in here and I'm going to delete it. Now I know that's fragmented and I wouldn't leave it that way. You could also use, if you went to Daniel Tall's um, class the other day, uh, Tools on Surface is another one of, I think it's, I think it's Afredo. Afredo, yeah, he's genius. So you could actually draw around, you could draw in a circle around there and it would cut it out right there because it actually draws onto the surface and cleans to the surface. Uh, but there's, you know, you can do it different ways. And so then you end up, okay, you draw a line around the perimeter for your backfill, where you want it to be, and then you have to pick all these edges and the backfill edges and then run from contours or you can do your soap skin bubble. So that's a lot of picking, all right? You gotta pick, hold down control and pick and pick, and then you, oh, I accidentally hit that, hold down shift, and then, oh crap, I got off of it, and you're back all over again picking these edges. So there's a couple of other things Genius back here did, and one of the things was I was at uh, base camp last time, and he was in a proctor in one of the classes, and I said, come here, man, show me, I, I, I'm picking all these little things, is there an easier way? He didn't say a word, he walked up, takes my mouse, okay, it's an auto save mode, and he highlights this whole area like this, and he right clicks and says, select, no, select only border edges. Oh. <laughs> 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 Huh? That's a bunch of, it's a case, man. So it's, it's man. Um, and then since I learned some other cool stuff, I didn't even know like Profile Builder, while we're in this, um, I'll deselect all that. Um, this is Profile Builder up here. And Dale was saying that there's a feature in there that would do it, otherwise we'll see. In Sketch UV, let me just find that one. So I can maybe see if he's got the same tool. Sketch UV is another one of Dale's tools, the guy that did Profile Builder. This little tool right here is Pass Select. So it's got to be one of these. This is Profile Builder. Bear with me, I haven't done this yet. Is that it? Edit Path. Path Mode. One of these tools will do it. But what it, uh, what it does is you can select that tool and just hover over these guys and it just picks them. It's really cool. I don't know really what else Sketch UV does. I'm sure it does some really cool things, but that's another, another interesting one to get. But from what I did, it, I didn't even know that Profile Builder, he has that built in. So anyways, just a couple of little tricks to show you guys. And let me get out of this edit. I'm going to undo my destruction. All right, so once I've got the proposed site done, uh, then I can start framing the house from there. So this same builder, um, I'll show you another one that I did for him. This was the site plan I was given for another house that he was doing, and he had already gone under contract with this job. And um, so I took the before and after, you know, the proposed site, existing site here, and the proposed site here, and you can see it's just like a, it's a back to front sloping lot, so it's a walkout basement. So you've got this big bowl that's created in there. And I've, what I've done in here is I've actually displaced the entire house. I know this is probably something some people would just go, why do you do that? Um, but that's the level of detail that Big Caddy and I like to take this thing to. So um, everything's been displaced for all the foundations, retaining walls, even the, the driveway. So I've got my cut and fill. So now when I can go compare these numbers with the, the after and the prior, and I do my, my uh, just take a calculator and subtract the two divided by 27 of how many cubic yards, and then what about 12, 15 loads of, of cubic yards per uh, truckload? And it was about 230 loads of dirt to come out of there to make this thing happen. And then I modeled all his retaining walls too. So I think I got that in here somewhere. So yeah, so you can see all the retaining walls that were in there. I didn't finish framing the house at this stage. And a uh, whole bunch of retaining walls on this job. And so I asked him, I said, uh, I said, how much you got in there for hauling dirt away? So 
I was just hoping to waste it on site. So you got 240 loads of dirt to come out of there, man. And then how many, how many, uh, how, how about your retaining walls? How much do you have in for that? I had a $30,000 allowance. How many, how much is that per square foot? $16 square foot. So I'm sitting there doing the math because an estimator, I can take that stone texture that you see or any texture and it just accumulates all those and I just put $16 in there and it came out to $59,000. 59,500 to be exact. So double, you know. Now it's cost plus job, so you know, he's covered in a sense, but he's the one who has to go tell that client, sorry, I'm off by double. So, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, so yeah, so he's, he is uh, having me do this beforehand now on, on all of his jobs for the most part. Is there any questions on the site stuff? I'm just kind of flying along. It's just, well, like SketchUp, it, there is no curve. It's actually edges that create that curve. So it just brings in edges. If you were to drill in on it, something may look like a perfect circle, but if you kept, if you drilled into it, they're just little edges that go around and create it. So as long as there are control points, like in the actual PDF, those would just segment out? Yeah, it just creates segments. That's all it's doing is converting it to segments. And like text is not really text. It's not something editable. It's just little edges that make up everything. What are you going to teach me now? Yeah. What is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. What is it? You could do that with edges and so forth? No, no, no. You have to create text with the extension and you have to edit it with the extension. You can't take text and create anything else. Right. You use the extension, write the text, and you can pass a type of extension. You're a genius. You're a genius. Okay, cool. Any other any other questions? How would you uh, do layback? Like, let's say you have like a plane that went ten feet in the ground. You want to maintain a one to one slope. How would you show that? You just model it out. I mean, literally, yeah, I I would start where my bottom of my slope is, where my top needs to be. Even if I needed to to use a you know use a T for tape measure and find out whatever your or protractor do you whatever you want. No, almost every, everything I do with the surface stuff is all done native tools. Any other questions? Yeah. When you did the uh, displacement, did you just do that manually as well? You just kind of took the floor plan uh, and, and submerged it into the ground to displace the, the amount of dirt? Yeah, um, good question, actually. When you, um, when you see these little side walls, where did we see that up in this scene right here? A 3D mouse stopped working on this one drawing, and I don't know why. Anybody else use a 3D mouse? Yeah, they're really cool. That's what I'm, that's what I'm flying around with right here. They're really, really cool. And Dwayne hates them, but that's okay. They'll get over it. So, um, yeah, I, I, what I did is I actually just went to the underside of, in this case, I went down to the underside of the subgravel underneath uh, the slab and also to the footings and everything. So you, what you can do when you've, when you've drawn that perimeter backfill going around and you've got your bottom plane of your subgrade, you just literally just draw a line down and, can, you know, to, and reference, infer to that point of your subgrade and then just keep going down from each one of these I just keep modeling down or, or drawing down and then connecting these faces. It doesn't take long, you're, you're just connecting all these little faces all the way around and then you just make sure it's airtight and so you can report a volume. Any other questions so far? Okay, yes sir. What was the extension for the text again? For text? Yeah. What did you call that? 3D editable text. 3D editable text? I should probably know this. Like, Isn't that yours? Not isn't that yours? <laughs> Tom Tom, T H O M, T H O M. Yeah. It's 3D text editor. Justin was showing off your stuff this morning. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I had asked somebody asked me about the, the framing thing, so I thought I'd show you that real quick. Um, these walls were all created with this plugin called Framer for SketchUp. That's our new one here. I'll pull that out and show you. Uh, you can model any size wall that you want. You can make your own walls. You can do rectangular walls. You could do gable walls. You could do shed walls if you put in your roof pitch. Um, these sections are completely customizable. I've got two by four, two by six, two by eight. Um, you can do anything. There's also a metric as well. Um, 
the guy that originally helped me with this was from France, so it was all inch and a half by three and a half, inch and a half by five and a half. I said, can we make it two by fours and two by sixes? <laughs> So uh, he created a, um, a separate section so we have actuals and nominals. So you can put in the nominal size, but then when you put in the actual size, that's what it actually models. Um, you can put uh, regular, regular plates, treated plates. In this case, we got a concrete slab, so I go with a treated plate. You can pick your end conditions. So let's, we'll do this last little wall since it was left off in this last example. I'm just gonna do one stud to one stud because I've got two corners in. Um, you can choose a wall board, whether it's sheathing or drywall. I just called it wall board because you don't know when you're doing this, whether it's the exterior or interior wall. And in this case, I've got OSB, but you can do anything you want. It comes with uh, drywall, dens glass, uh, OSB, plywood, zip panels, uh, but you can make your own. You can actually make your own textures or use your own textures for whatever wall board you're using or even for the material. And um, I'll leave the drywall off right now for clarity, but you can add it. And I'll show you what these offsets do. Actually, I'll, I've got to offset these walls. So when I'm drawing a wall in between these two walls, I need to cover the ends of the opposite walls or the ones they're connecting to. So that's what this offset is. And really, it's just a glorified push-pull done for you automatically. So we'll say four inches at the start to pull it four inches. So it's a positive number. And at the end, I want to pull it four inches, which is a positive number. So sometimes you're doing negatives and positives in here. Stud spacing, height. We'll leave the roof slope because there's it's a rectangular wall. And then you just pick from point to point, from here to here, and you have your wall. And it overlapped those edges, and you've got all your studs and plates. You've got your treated plates, and you've got your regular plates. And then with Estimator, these are each, uh, Framer actually builds these things on their own layers so that Estimator can discern between whether it's a treated plate, regular plate, stud, sheathing, that sort of thing. Uh, you could put in a door, doors and windows, so you could say, uh, let's put in a, um, uh, I don't care what size door, you can put a bigger door in there. Let's go with like a, bless you, seven foot door, seven foot tall, let's do multiple jacks, let's do two jacks, double LVL. Now, when you see that LVL 11 and a quarter, I just did that in the nominal, because it's easy for me to remember, but the actual dimension was one and three quarter by 11 and a quarter in the settings. And then you get, you get this little x-ray deal and you can infer, like you can either tab to go left and right, or I usually go to the middle because I'm usually inferring a midpoint in a drawing. And you can put multiple ones if you wanted to, otherwise hit enter and you've got everything. You got your cripples, jacks, you can edit these at any time. You can say edit this door and go with um, two two by tens and it'll change it. And if you've got all your stuff, uh, if you're doing any estimate, and you've got all your layers with everything assigned to it, it's instantly calculating all your materials and plates and studs and headers and everything else. Uh, you could actually do, let's say that you wanted to balloon frame that and make it a, um, um, let's see, let's edit this wall. Let's say you're gonna make that a gable wall and you're gonna balloon frame up. You can come in here and put the pitch in. You put the pitch in, uh, you could do the degrees. I don't know what the degree is for an 812, so you could do, say, 8 colon 12 and OK, and you'll have your gable roof. You can also do shed walls. So it's a pretty cool tool, but also I was doing a job for, a, um, for Dwayne's company in Canada. It was a huge development, 130 units. They outsourced the modeling to me, even though he wanted to do it. And um, I was, they didn't care about framing or any of that kind of stuff. They just wanted the visuals. So I started doing the, the typical SketchUp mass modeling deal where I'm tracing around the perimeter and doing push-pull to pull the walls up and laying out the windows and doors and cutting them out and pushing them through. And I thought, God, it's got to be, I'm so used to using Framer. So I did a little time study and I timed myself doing the walls, you know, with native SketchUp tools and it was 10 minutes. And then I did it again using Framer and it was like seven minutes or something like that. So I just started using that and then just throwing, you know, keeping the framing in case they ever needed it, I saved it for, for later. But it's a pretty fast tool for that, so. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah, you, you need flooring as well? Uh, you could, I mean, the, the tool actually from, you know, I'm not the programmer, I bought the, the guts of this uh, from a guy and uh, it had a basic floor system and a basic roof tool, but they were not where I wanted it to be. So I didn't want to put it out in this. You can do individual uh, lumber. So for instance, I could come in here and do a joist and like a two by 10 joist, it just happened to be on that. And um, when you're starting, it's gonna be in the center, but you can tab over to one side and then do it from there to there. And it's creating this component for you. So 
then an estimator you could just say it's two by ten by sixteen joists, and then you could just do your move copy. You could do your other bands, you know, but then you just move copy sixteen times ten, however many that is. I guess I didn't do that. Oh, I moved it. Wasn't paying attention. Actually, I just deleted it. Please don't go away. Oh well, do it again. Joist, two by ten. Start modeling it. Tab. Now I know it had to be an inch and a half shorter for a band over there, but you can move copy, move control, and go sixteen and enter. And then you could say times or asterisk times uh, times fifteen or twelve, something like that. Oh, guess what? <laughs> Tom, why? Why? Bug splat. Say goodbye to this model, because it's going to go away in about three, two, one, something like that. Splat. All right, enough of that one. <laughs> Any other questions on Framer? <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you can't, not from my stuff, but yeah, you can create window and door schedules. That, that's better off for some of the big layout guys. So. Um, Have you looked at any spec plus software that they're not? Plus spec? Yeah, yeah. Plus yeah. Spec. yeah, yeah. Actually, I bought it when it first came out a few years ago. I was like, yes, finally. And, but I, it, I know they've done a lot of improvements. You know, Andrew's really worked hard on that thing, but it did, I couldn't customize it. You know, and I was like, okay, cool. I can model these walls and I get the sheet. Well, I, I nails. Uh, Tyvek, uh, you know, Tyvek tape, that kind of stuff. And I could not, you couldn't customize it. Now, they probably come a long way. I mean, it's an amazing tool. But uh, that's when I kind of, after I spent the money on it, I decided to create my own thing that was completely customizable. So, any other questions on framing? No, I mean, as far as steel, the problem with that, and Tom Tom could probably help me with that, but it's, it's basically geometry. So you know, it's easy to do rectangular things. You start getting like a C-channel kind of deal in there, and I don't know how to even do that. So um, you, could, you could tell it to be looking like metal, but it wouldn't have the channel in it, but you could still get all your results if you wanted to use the tool and report it out, even though it won't look like a metal stud. Okay, so you can plug in the parameters for the cost. Yeah, yeah. You could just, instead of looking at a lumbered wall, just change the texture to metal. It's going to still be a rectangle or, you know, uh, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have a C-channel to it. But you could still get all your same results. It just wouldn't look exactly right. You had a question? Hip roofs on the next version? Hip roofs? Yeah, that's another thing I really want. Roofs are always a big, big pain. Um, you know, in fact, I can show you the one that <laughs> Mr. Belk over here, wherever he was, he's gone now, I guess. But that roof was... Uh, this is that house that you were seeing in that initial slide. And if you look at just the roof framing only, you can see that's a lot of, and the, the problem with doing it to get estimating out of it is you gotta be disciplined about how you do it. It's easy to mass model stuff. Um, but now when you get into every one of these being their own component that you have to be able to report out, See, this one's a two by six by 20, and this was a two by six probably by 18 or something like that as they go down. So it's, even these parametric ones, I, I haven't seen anything that makes it perfect, you know? I used SoftPlan for years, and it will automatically auto frame a roof. But if I got in there and looked at it, it's not exactly, you know, the exact cuts and so forth. But they're not easy. So you get in there and, you know, straight roofs, straight rafters, like I did with that joist, and you just copy and paste over 16 inches on center. That's easy. When you get into these, you have to start trimming them to your hips. Yeah. It's not easy. And uh, I wish there was a magic uh, thing for... There's some cool tools out there, though. There's um, uh, Chuck Valley. Anybody use Valley Architect stuff? He's got an instant roof tool. And... Um, and that does framing too. I haven't really explored it enough from the framing side, but he also has it to where um, you can do like clay tile roofs and uh, standing seam roofs. Anybody ever tried that with, with his tool? Yeah. So I had a whole a big house in Portland. I wish I had the thing open. It was a huge house in Portland with all clay tile roofs. 
you know, the 3D clay tile, all the ridges, hips, or not hips, but uh, yeah, hips and uh, not valleys, but ridges and hips and, and, uh, and the actual clay tiles. And what you do with that is literally you just pick the planes of the roof with this tool. You just, you just pick all those planes and pick the ridges and the hips. Select all that, click a button, and poof. It's a 3D tiled roof that looks amazing. And I do not have a knot. He's another planet, too. I don't, I don't get it. So yeah, any other questions on the framing? Yes, sir. Uh, mine was kind of the same thing as the steel question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you were to, let's say, create a specific profile and we leave that as a profile number, do any of the, uh, I guess, metadata that's added by the like, uh, profile builder or specifically, he's got, <laughs> what's this other one, quantifier? Quantifier, yeah. Do those two play together? Like, can they kind of swap information where you might be able mm -hmm. to, like, use framework and say, hey, use this component and yeah, yeah. Like if you're doing vertical steel in a, in a foundation, I do it all the time. I just I use Profile Builder to model the, uh, the the number four rebar, and I'll model it up eight or nine feet, whatever it is, and then just copy that all the way around. As I'm copying, I'm getting my totals. So estimator is reading the lineal footage of it, and all I'm telling it to do is I buy it in 20-foot sticks. I don't care how many individual cut pieces. I buy 20-foot sticks. So I just say take every bit of number four rebar and then divide by 20 and put a waste factor, and it's done. And as you move it around, so same for this for assemblies, his assemblies, that cool nine nine inch or nine foot by ten inch foundation that has the footing and the rebar and all this stuff. I made that like five years ago, <laughs> and I use it all the time. And on the stick of knowledge, all my profiles and assemblies are on there for anybody that wants them. Some of them I don't use anymore, but you know, feel free to use them. Any other framing questions? All right. Any other questions of something that I've covered? Yes. How do you bring in your truss drawings from like the truss manufacturer? Great. Okay. Um, from a specific truss manufacturer, did you say? Okay. Yeah, a lot of them use um, um, MyTech. Yeah. A lot of them use MyTech. And you'll ask them to send you the file, and they'll send you the 2D layout file. You know, no, that's not what I want. I want the 3D file. Some of these guys don't know it exists, that they can do that in their defense. So. Well, what you can do is you can tell them that you need the 3D file, all right? And what they need to do is when they're in there looking at, like, like they're looking at that in my tech, all they have to do is go to their view, save as roof trusses, and send you the file. Now, a lot of them, if you'll see, when you import one that they've done everything, their walls are just walls, studded walls. There's no openings in them because they're not taking the time to do that. They're just laying out their exterior walls at the right height and then putting a roof on it and floor trusses. So it's best if you get to know these guys and you say, just cut off all that other stuff. I just want the roof or I just want the floor. Because otherwise they're sending you a really bloated model that has a bunch of stuff in it that you're just gonna delete. So what you do is you, you take that file, it's gonna be either a DXF or a DWG, and it's usually gonna be somewhere from you know, five to 15 megabytes, depending on the size of the roof. It's gonna be a big file, it's not gonna be, if you see a file that's it's not gonna have anything 3D in it. It's just gonna be that flat 2D. But it works great. I mean, I use it with every job. I've only had one, and I'm working for builders across the country now, so I've only had one, one builder in Denver who his guy was using some antiquated uh, system, and I couldn't get it. And that's it. So most of them do it, and there's you know, different manufacturers. Some of them will actually bring in the gang nails and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of cool, but not all the time. Any other questions? Other questions on that? Um, I'll show you a model real quick at the end of this. This is one I'm actually doing for a builder in Seattle that is really, really messed up. Really messed up. I would not want to build this. I mean, you're, you're talking, all these are cantilevered LVLs that go way back into the house. LVL joists everywhere, and they're ripped because they're sloping quarter inch to the foot once you get to the exterior. Look at this wall. You got a wall that's like two feet back from the main floor, or the lower level wall. How do you waterproof all this stuff? So what you're seeing in red is things that they've not answered of my questions. Um, I've got issue tracker things here and there. Like you can see the roof, um, roof trusses. I don't know what's holding up this corner because there is no column. <laughs> so we're trying to figure that one out. Um, he's got these. He's got these knee braces here. Can we say bracket? What is that? Can we say bracket? Bracket. Yeah. Sorry. Bracket. So he's, he calls them knee braces. So I call them knee braces. 
So these brackets here, he, he gave me the detail, the structural engineer did, of how these, uh, all these connections would go down to the foundation and these bolted connections at the top. And he's got these big five and a quarter PSL beams. Uh, he's got one on this end and one on this end, and he had one underneath each side of the opening of this door. But he didn't have anything where these knee, these knee braces or brackets are. I, they added these two in, so now we've got a question back to him going, can we just consolidate those instead of spending $2,000 on extra beams? And So we're still in the middle of that. Headers that don't fit, I mean, they had you know, 13 and a half inch headers and a nine foot wall with an eight foot door, things that just don't work. And so th this, you know, SketchUp is a great way of, that's why I'm saying these automatic things or parametric things, they sort of just kind of, you don't, they glance over things to me. So if you're putting in exactly what you're gonna be building, then, you know, then it takes the guesswork out of it. The same case here, they said, nope, it's gotta be a 13 and a half inch header. You can go up and get rid of your double top plates and strap it. But that still leaves eight, 11, and five eighths or something like that. I don't know what his rough opening or what his unit dimension is, but he may not be able to fit it in there. So I've kept the, you know, the issue tracker on there until that time. And with issue tracker, when you place these things on an item, uh, I think I got one in my blue beam over here. Um, yeah, this is a whole nother one I was gonna show you. So you can see here, it generates this nice report. You know, here's the issue, here's, here it is, and you can put your logo in there and all that information. So that one's kind of a mess. Um, anybody use Enscape? E-N-S-A-P-A. -E -N so what I've been doing is actually, when I'm showing these clients this stuff, I'm actually opening up in Enscape, which is real time inside of SketchUp. It just looks better, looks kind of cool. Just looks more realistic. You can change the time of day, you know, bring the sun in how you want it. But it's just a cool tool when you're showing a client, it's a little bit more realistic uh, model. So that's Enscape, they're actually here. You know that one job that I was showing you before? This one, uh, right here. No, nope, not this one, second one. I take that back, I guess I don't have that model open, it must have splatted somewhere along the way. Plus I've only got a couple minutes I'll go for any questions. Yeah. Do you find yourself redrawing whatever the structural engineer is submitting to you, or are we speaking the same language? They're not submitting anything to me 3D. So I'm just using their 2D drawings to do that. You have to redraw yeah. 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 And I'm a civil engineer by background, so I can't I can't stamp plans because I'm not a PE. So I usually on my own drawings or on my own plans, I use Forte to model beams and headers and stuff like that and then I'll model them in SketchUp, but I usually paint anything I don't know about, I'll, I'll paint it in red, and then I give that to my structural engineer, and then he'll review the, the model, and then he'll change it, he'll review my Forte file and change it if need be, yes? Do you have any best practices for the cost estimating side of this? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just being disciplined about it. Uh, I do, uh, everything I model, I do it with intention of being estimated. Uh, with what regards to what specific? Well, in terms of the actual Yeah, there's an items database that comes with Estimator and you can completely customize it. So it's one file that you can go in and update all your pricing, add new products. Essentially, it's a, it's a list of all your products that you use. It comes with like 2,000 items in HB and that's CSI cost codes and stuff like that, but you can customize it to yourself. Um, I had a set designer I was talking to the other day and he has a certain list of materials. I said, you can have just that list of materials. You model something and just match it to whatever's in your list and, and price it. So if you need to update your pricing, you get a new lumber price list. You can update all your pricing, save it, go back into Estimator and sync with database and it'll update all your pricing. You can actually pick different databases too. You may have different cities that you're working in, different product, you know, so you can mix and match that way. Anybody else? Well, if there's no other questions, I think we're right on time. I thank you very much for your time.